notice when it isn't there, um, when people are callous toward people. Uh, but I think just the acute observation of people as they live their lives and suffer and grieve and die, um, that in itself presents an ethical question that the reader actually supplies or answers. Um, I don't think it's useful for a novelist to begin with a, a moral or a theme. I think it's better to begin with story and, and character and have every, those things develop out of characters as they live their lives. I once wrote an essay on that. Okay. Let me talk to you first. You talk. Um, I wrote an essay on the ethics of fiction writing. I proposed various rules uh, for fiction writers to practice. And my basic rule was Hippocrates, above all, do no harm. <laughs> and uh, uh, a man just wrote me, and he was writing, he was involved in some campus shooting of some sort. And he'd known all, a lot of stuff about it, and he was worried that his writing about this would provoke other people to commit the crime. He, he can't really do anything about the crime, really. I said, you can avert your eyes to some crucial things that these people did that let them get away with it. Um, you notice that in Breaking Bad. They told you an awful lot about how to make meth. But the camera eventually turns away and leaves out a crucial step so you don't you get pulled up your condition. <laughs> I think that's what ethical writing is all about. In the introduction, it mentioned the breadth of your written work. And then you spoke largely today about attention. And I wonder if there's a connection there, an, an intentional connection on your part, to be attentive to a variety of things, or more of a connection in the sense that you happen to write about a variety of things because of your attention. Yes, the latter. Um, I'm, you know how they used to, they talk about people are channel surfers? I'm the opposite of a channel surfer. I lock onto any channel and I'm fascinated by what's going on, even if it's in a foreign language. And it drives my wife crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, a lot of my topics just came accidentally to me just because I was reading one book or I heard a story or something like that. I didn't intend to ever become a historical novelist. Um, but I just came across these subjects that fascinated me so much I had to write them down. Um, and that's part of that. I've, I've always been in love with history. In fact, I was once going through a bookstore when I was in college. And I said to my friend who was browsing with me, you know, someday I'm only going to be writing, reading history. And he said, why? And then I realized I didn't have the slightest idea why I'd said that. Because I had no intention of reading history. <laughs> I got through history as soon as I could. And it came back at me. Um, so I think that's true of a lot of novels. Some people, like Philip Roth writes about his own experience and transforms it in some way. But a lot of other writers I know just, like my friend Jim Shepard is the same way. That he just comes across something and feels he has to write it down. And uh, it's, it's happenstance. And you hope that God has directed you toward this subject. Um, I, I always think it, I'm doing God's work, but probably others don't. <laughs> I noticed your, I think it's your latest novel, the one about the famous murder case mm -hmm. in New York, which draws on an actual case. Mm -hmm. And I, I presume that Jesse James' book also draws on. So, and I know I, that seems to be a growing trend with novelists to kind of combine fiction, but using actual situations that happen. How, how do you, think, why do you think that is coming to the fore now? Did you feel certain? What are the constraints that it puts on you as a creative writer when you're working with facts rather than ones that you've just created out of your imagination? Good question. <laughs> uh, um, I think it's becoming more prevalent because, for one thing, the libel and slander laws have changed. So it used to be you had to, you could never, there were rule not a play. You mm -hmm. couldn't actually name people and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Now you can't. Partly has to do with television and you know, newspapers and reality TV. Um, I think that it, there's just a book that was put out about this. I can't remember its real title, but it's about the biographical novel. And we talked about all the people, Joyce Carol Oates and so forth, who have done this. And I think it's because they don't, it's too easy an escape to make something up. 
it's not, it's better to have, uh, at least for me, in many cases, to exercise your imagination in dreaming of somebody else's life. It's like an actor taking on a part that I have to take the part of all these people rather than remembering something that somebody said to me. And it's, it's a little bit harder because most of the time I'm writing way back before I was born. Um, so everything has to be checked out. Um, <clears throat> I have a little book called The Farm Cyclopedia of 1882, and I go to it all the time because it tells me what people did for health, and what, what kind of cook, foods they cooked, how they raised their animals, and so forth. And uh, you constantly have to refer to that sort of thing when you're writing historical fiction. Um, I think there's a, what happens when, in, when you're writing only from your own mind is you can go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And when you're writing, the, the constraints, I think, of writing within somebody else's life is kind of like what Robert Frost said about writing poetry and rhymes. If you don't have rhymes, it's like playing tennis without a net. Mm -hmm. That the constraints themselves actually make more powerful uh, fiction, or at least excite the imagination in some way. So that's kind of why I do it. Mm -hmm. Finally, O'Connor is considered a great Catholic writer, but she never really wrote much about Catholics. I can think of only one story in which she really used Catholic characters. Do you consider yourself a Catholic writer? If you don't write about Catholics? Uh, I'm a Catholic who writes, <laughs> and I call, I, I call myself a Catholic writer, but it's uh, there. There's kind of a squeamishness about saying that because, you know, I, I feel like I'm being judged. Uh, that doesn't seem very Catholic to me. You know, uh, I think the idea of what I appreciate, appreciate about Catholicism is that it originally meant universal. So that, and that it's, it embraces lots of different subjects, and much better than people who are evangelicals who can only write in a certain way. So they're hamstrung because of their, the focus of their faith, whereas Catholicism, because of the analogical imagination, sees God operating in all lives, even if they're criminalized. Um, so it's easier to be a Catholic novelist, I think, than it is to be a Protestant novelist. I think Jewish novelists are probably feel the same ease as Catholic novelists do in embracing the world. Would you write differently if you weren't Catholic? Oh, yeah. Well, I, it's hard to say how, but I, I just remember my earliest memories of going to church and there was this spectacular dome, this is in Holy Angels in Omaha, Nebraska, a beautiful painting of Jesus on his ascension. And he was nearly nude, you know, things were flowing off him, but there were angels around and it was just spectacular and it just, the, the corporality of it was really intriguing to me. And that, that was always the case with the, the Mass. It every, it, it's so bodily. And um, also the fact that they were repeating the same stories over and over again. And yet I noticed my parents and everybody else paying attention. You know, I can remember probably at the age of six, I said, oh, didn't we hear that one before? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, I, and I'm sure that's influenced me, the idea that narrative, uh, drama, the, the theatricality of a mass is something they can revere, and that turned me into a writer. One of my first, uh, I, in my book of essays, I talked about myself when I was in kindergarten, and they were assigning parts for everybody in a Christmas pageant. And I have a twin brother, Rob, and my twin brother, Rob, was selected to be a major, I think, or something, and then I was skipped. And <laughs> I thought it meant that I had flunked out of kindergarten. <laughs> and so I went out to, during recess, I had a bravery to go up to the nun who was teaching us and kind of quivering. And I said, you didn't give me a part. And she immediately looked down and she said, well, we don't have a narrator. You can be St. Luke. And so I couldn't read yet. So my mom <laughs> sat with me with Luke's nativity narrative and she we're at the dining room table, she just recited it over and over again. And I somehow memorized it. And I 
remember at the Christmas pageant, standing in front of all these people, I think I was wearing a bathrobe. <laughs> I didn't get aware of a beard like everybody else did. Um, I saw my sister Ginny looking at me in this, don't screw this up, I have friends here. Boy. <laughs> My mom and dad were looking kind of fondly. My dad did said he thought I was going to be a politician because I was practicing speaking. <laughs> no way. Um, but as I was reciting Luke, I realized that all these people were paying attention to me. And kind of like you are here. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, and, and I was reciting words I had no idea what they meant, like swaddling clothes and laying them in a manger and all these things. Uh, but uh, all these people were paying attention to that and realized the power of language. Uh, and they're very uh, vital way, I guess. And, and I think that turned me toward wanting to be a writer. And uh, I think that's carried on throughout my life. Enjoyed it. One of the worst experiences that I had was I was supposed to give a speech when I was in high school in some kind of competition. And I was still writing the speech when I realized I had to get in my car and go to the Tournament. So it was incomplete, and I it, you had to memorize it, you know, and I, there was nothing to memorize it. And so I was kind of dabbing away, making, filching from other people's speeches that I heard. It was just awful. This one woman was a judge, put her head in her hands. Like <laughs> <laughs> and after that was done, which I decided, when they had us go to kind of an extent radius one where they gave us um, just a theme. And we were supposed to dream something up, come back and speak it. And then I saw her, who was so mournful, said, oh, you can do this. <laughs> and I, I realized how the, your worst experience and your best experiences can be combined. And I realized I got through that. I didn't, nobody attacked me. I didn't die. And um, it came, gave me kind of the courage to become a teacher, I think, stand in front of people who like killing. <laughs> uh, get away with yes. uh, I was also reminded by the title of your talk of Leonard Connor, and I'm going to cheat and read a quote of hers um, that, until I heard your talk tonight, was one of my favorite quotes about being a writer. Uh, he wrote, the Catholic writer, uh, insofar as he has the mind of the church, will feel light from the standpoint of the central Christian mystery that it has, for all its horror, been found by God to be worth dying for. But this should enlarge, not narrow, his field of vision. And that enlarging, that really seems to resonate with what you were saying in response to this gentleman yeah. here. I wonder if you have any other thoughts on that. Well, I, I, there's another quote I really love by Flannery O'Connor, who says, uh, the Catholic novel should be hotly in pursuit of the real. I, I like that idea. That, um, that, that was the talk of your Kushwa Center lecture in 2000. Was that right? Yes. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was larger in my memory than that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great title. Yeah. Who, who wrote Leaves of Grass? Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman. He said uh, some line in there. Do I repeat myself? Then I repeat myself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was wondering about how your, your quality of attention and your experience as a writer impacts the way you preach when, when you have the opportunity to preach as a deacon. Um, I, I don't do personal things when I'm preaching usually. And mostly it's teaching. Mm -hmm. um, so I examine the scripture and try and explain it or interpret it. Um, in fact, I was instructed in our homiletics class never to talk about yourself, but I know some people do that all the time, um, and it can get tedious. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really embarrassing once a guy who would tell me, it, 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 at church, this was a Protestant church, he would say what happened with his kids the day before, you know, how he spent them and why. I thought, TMI. <laughs> uh, I'm ready to get to something more. And I, I like the fact that Catholicism is not about the preacher. Um, I, when I see these guys struggling on the stage on television, um, the evangelist, I, it seems kind of creepy to me because it seems like he's important and the Gospels aren't. And I want to reverse that. Did that answer your question? 
Well, do you, as a writer, sort of enter into the mind that you said you played Luke? You know, do, oh, you, right. <laughs> do you enter yeah. into the mind of the evangelist maybe with a different sensibility than those of us who aren't writers? My, That's hard to really say. I, I think I approach it on more as a scholar does, mm -hmm. but I probably say it more succinctly. <laughs> it used to be an economic, except when I repeat myself. Uh, how do you think your education, your Jesuit education, has affected your writing? Um, okay, that's not kind of like offense against Jesuits. I'm just wondering how, how do you think it's. <laughs> No, I really like the, <coughs> the Jesuits, and a lot of them are still my friends. And I think uh, <laughs> um, you know, they were so welcoming to me. And I, I, after the hideous life I had in grade school, it was so, such a liberating time to go to college, high school. It was an all boys school. That made a difference, I think. There weren't fights over girlfriends and so forth. Mm -hmm. I know. Um, but I. They always, they always seem to appreciate any kind of creativity, uh, even creativity that went against what they just said to you in class. Um, and, and that might <coughs> continue, of course, when in college having Jesuits, and I got my master's degree with Jesuits, so I had a surplus of education with Jesuits. It's always been um, in my thinking, especially when I got into graduate school, because earlier I'd been in kind of I straddled the Vatican II. A good deal of my life was before when we were all in Latin, I was an altar boy and all that stuff. And then Vatican II came and changed things, and we were reading completely different kinds of theology when I was in college and, and, and in graduate school. And my perception of who God was really changed in, in those years. I hope it's changed for everybody now. But what's interesting about Sister Thorne is to see that old religion as I used to practice it. And my family did at least. Um, and it's so much, there's so much greater freedom. And I think our freedom is really important to God. Was it, was it very clear to you that you had a vocation to write? And did you have a lot of years of like, rejection? Or were you going to be stars right from the beginning? <laughs> going out and became bestseller? <laughs> um, I, didn't, I didn't get published until I was 30. My, my novel was published. I, I, think I published stories in high school and college, but not in major magazines. And I, my major, my first uh, major publication in a major magazine was when I was 26 years old. Um, I remember I was dating a woman at the time. She said, "You better hurry. You're 26. It's time for you to get to I know people who are 76 who published their first novel. So, um, I, I did have an easier path. I wrote one novel I didn't even try to submit. And then when I wrote Desperados, it was I, it got to the editor on Friday, he bought it on Monday. He just read it over the weekend. It was your first published novel. Yeah. And I, my, my, when I first approached an agent, she took me on. So I hear about all these other people have to wait a long time for this stuff to happen. I really feel for them. Um, and it's just luck more than anything else. Um, and it, there was something that clicked for me when I was in my last semester at the University of Iowa at the Writers' Workshop. And I suddenly knew how to write something that would get published. And I don't know what, I don't know what the secret is. I just knew that, wow, if I wrote this, it will get published. And that's happened to me most of the time. And if I finish something, there are all kinds of false starts, but if I finish something, it's always been published. Um, I don't know why that is exactly. I will hope everybody has that experience. <laughs> I know it doesn't. Yes. Uh, the influence of what you've read on um, and who you are as a writer has been very much on display uh, in, in your talk. I wonder if you could share with us some of your criteria for selecting what you're going to read to make sure that you're reading the right things for your writing. Wow. Um, I really don't have any. Uh, I did, something comes to me, often books are sent to me, and I start them and I think, well, no. Nope. I, I judge the, uh, 
National Book Awards one year, and they give you 360 books in the course of three months to read. And, but you discover really early on that this book is not going to win. This book is not even going to be a finalist. You know, there's a lot of dreck out there, so I like put those aside and just concentrate on it. We ended up getting a, a, a short list of like 30 books. Right, we got down to five and we selected the one. And um, that criteria was just taste, I guess. Um, you know, at least for me, while wow, this is captivating, and some of the other judges, it wasn't. Um, yeah, I don't argue, argue with uh, the final selection. It was, well, I'm not going to tell you who it was, but I was up there. I was the one who announced it. I was up there in my tuxedo, and Steve Martin was the MC. You know, and, I, and I was reading about all the finalists. And I thought, I could say the book I wanted won the National Book Award. <laughs> so we don't have to contend with the four judges. But uh, I decided to be a good soldier. <laughs> and that was the one that I didn't like. But uh, somebody just wrote me about this. Uh, I, he saw an ancient interview with me where I talked about a book and I said it wasn't a good book. And he wanted to know why I said it wasn't a good book. I said, you know, it's just, it's basically taste, but it's about structure, it's about the quality of the prose, it's about the depth of characterization. All those things are what determine whether we think a book is quality or not. And it, it probably varies for a lot of people, but there seems to be kind of a unanimity of opinion about most books. Those that enter the canon of it. The whole tip and ask a second question. Um, in the past, I think roughly two years, there's been a lot of debate um, about the present state of sort of Catholic writers or the future of Catholic writers in places like the New York Times and First Thing. And a number of a number of writers, um, you know, I think like uh, Paul Eli, the poet Dana Joya, um, have sort of compared the present moment uh, unfavorably to the mid 20th century, where they look and say, oh, you have major publishing houses like Farrar Strauss, right. bringing out books by Flannery O'Connor, Thomas Merton, uh, Walker Percy is coming out of the scene in the 60s and onward. Mm -hmm. And there's a tendency um, to say, well, look, we, you know, we had all these Catholic writers, and they were very much in the mainstream, winning Pulitzers and National Book Awards. And they say, well, if you look today, literary fiction seems to be much more uniformly secular is kind of the argument. And I'd be interested in hearing um, your thoughts on that, that sort of decline narrative of the Catholic writer. I, I think a lot of time, I, I discovered that a lot of people at least were raised Catholic and you didn't know that. Um, so I, I see a lot of Catholics, or at least people with Catholic backgrounds, who are writers for publishing. Um, I didn't understand why Paul Eli said that about that nobody was around because he had edited my book Exiles about Gerard <laughs> <laughs> It seemed like a deliberate slap. <laughs> um, Dana Joya kind of said that. I mean, he kind of reinforced it, but he saw, he at least pointed out that people who were, were doing it, like Alice McDermott and yeah. some of the other people. Um, I think it's just more subterranean, so actually. I think it, and I, maybe people were more than willing to just identify as Catholic. Um, I think they're looking at a more receptive and open embrace uh, of the world and of God. And we're willing to say it's not a, I'm not going to categorize this. I'm just going to present what God is like, um, at least in the world. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank <laughs> you.